so welcome, welcome. I know we'll have a few people drifting in after this. Um, welcome to A Seat at the Table, Diversifying Women's Leadership Across Camden. And why stop at Camden? Why not go beyond? We can do this. So um, we did mention if you'd like to introduce yourselves, say your name, where you're from in the chat bar, then that would be really great. Um, I'd like to see as many of your fabulous faces as possible. So although we will, we will be recording the main room, but if you don't mind being recorded, then please do turn on your camera, um, but mute your, your laptop um, unless you're speaking. So, okay. My name is Dion Usherwood. I'm head of Children's Integrated Commissioning here at Camden. Um, I'm joined today by my lovely co-host, Olivia Vincenti, who you'll hear from in a few moments. I'm not going to talk for long because we've got an absolutely jam-packed agenda that our great colleagues have been working on um, for today. Um, this year, we're thinking about International Women's Day and linking it to one of the four core missions of the Camden Renewal Commission, um, borough-wide diversity in positions of power. Now in Camden, we've got the aim that by 2030, those holding positions of power in Camden will be as diverse as our diverse community. And that will be such a rich thing to hold. And we want to make sure also that the next generation is ready to follow. And you'll be hearing a bit from one of our youth MPs as well later. We're using this opportunity today to raise women's voices from different sectors and discuss how we tackle racial and gender inequality in positions of power and leadership, specifically for Camden's Black, Asian and other ethnic women. Now, talking is important. Talking is an important factor to this. And it brings me back to when I was 14 and I was sitting in a school assembly. And you know, when you're 14, you're in school assembly. It's not something that usually kind of captures your imagination much. But for me, I sat down in assembly one day and a young Asian woman strode up to the stage and she was so confident and she stood on that stage and she asked us, what don't you like about your community? What don't you like about where you live? And we were throwing things out and people were talking and she really got us impassioned. She got us talking and shouting and getting angry about the things that we did not like about our community. And when she'd got us to that peak, to that height, heightened state, she said, and who's done anything to make a change? And it's so difficult to get a group of, you know, 500 teenagers quiet, but you could have heard a pin drop in that room. And that young lady, she was a youth worker. She was a leader to me. I hadn't come across her before, but she'll never know this, but she completely changed the course of my life. She spurred me to do community action um, and, you know, led me to the career that I'm in now. Uh, because what she ended with at the end of her presentation was, you can't keep on complaining unless you're part of the solution. And so today we are going to be part of that solution. As well as talking, we're gonna consider what next? How do we take action? And what part can we really play in being part of the solution? And so I'm going to firstly congratulate you guys on finding the time because in this pandemic viral virtual world, it's so difficult to find time, but you have found that time to dedicate the space to prioritizing women, to developing yourselves and I guess on the developing yourselves point, please, if you hear people talking about leadership and leadership traits and you think, oh, actually, I never thought about that. Yeah, I do that. I have that. Note it down because you never know where you might be able to use that in talking to your manager, in, in talking, um, at, in speaking at interviews, you know, just make sure you're keeping note of these things. And similarly, if you are thinking, oh, I don't do that, or, oh, I wish I was more like this or that, we don't want you to be afraid or worried. Um, it might not be your way, or it might be something that we as a community can help you to develop. So network, um, reach out to those who interest you. This is a safe space. We want you to respect each other's views, but we want you to be able to feel safe enough to share views as well. Um, if you're affected by anything that's discussed in this space and would like to talk, we'll put up something from um, Janelle a bit later and then you can um, contact her if you'd like to speak to her. And for those of you 
choosing to tweet today or on Instagram or whatever other platform, um, the hashtag is choose to challenge. That's choose to challenge. And my final thing that I'll say is that after that interview last night, let's take courage from what we've what we've seen. Um, let's know that no matter how difficult or scary it might seem, there are times where you really do need to challenge and where you do need to correct the narrative that's being spun um, for women. So this is our time and I'll hand over to Olivia. Oh, thank you, Dion. Um, as Dion said, my name is Olivia Vincenti and um, I worked in Camden from 2003 to 2016, lastly, as a joint head of service for Children's Commissioning. Um, I'm particularly excited and pleased to co-host this event with Dion because I initiated the first one in 2013, the first International Women's Day event in Camden. And this event has grown um, in strength since then, evidenced, well, by you and the groundswell of women not settling for less. And so for me, International Women's Day is about amplifying women's voices. Now that's only one day. Also, it's um, Women's History Month, the month of March. A, a month isn't enough. This is actually a lifetime commitment, amplifying women's voices. Now, here in Camden, women, there are many women leaders, not just in the council, um, but also in the community. And I really want to encourage actually all women to think of themselves as leaders, leaders in their own lives, leaders in their families, leaders in their communities. And um, there's no limit to um, the, the number of leaders, of women leaders that there can be. Now, however, we know that sexism and gender inequality is not just about numbers. Um, it's systemic and institutional. And that means we have to not just change who's leading, but also change the system and really redesign it for equality. As Dion said, there's really, there's much to do. And COVID-19 has been one of those revealers, um, just as Black Lives Matter has been a revealer of systemic racism. And this pandemic has disproportionately um, affected women and Black and Brown women in particular in terms of the devastatingly poor outcomes and economic outcomes. There's the increase in domestic violence and the shouldering of you know, the main responsibility of caring. This is our time. And often in times of crises, um, we see progress. So at this event, a seat at the table, diversifying women's leadership across Camden. It's part, as Dion said, as the global theme for International Women's Day. So we can all choose to challenge, and that includes our allies choosing to challenge and celebrate women's achievements. But we need collectively, um, each of us can help to make the changes that we want to see. So let's choose to challenge and we won't keep quiet. So I love that song, Roar. It's really important. So this is about not keeping quiet. I'm so delighted that um, Councillor Georgia Gould is here and who's the leader of the council. And um, I don't think Councillor Gould needs much introduction, really. I think many of you will have met her or seen her before, or if not, here's, our, here's um, the opportunity uh, to meet Councillor Georgia Gould. So Georgia, I can't see you, so I hope you're there. Yay, yay, great. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much. It's such a privilege to finish, to, to follow three um, such amazing women. And to be honest, listening to your story and thinking that when I first met you, you were doing exactly that, inspiring other young people and working on minding the gap and, and making sure their voices were heard. So it's it's really powerful to hear that that was your inspiration and that you put that into practice um, for others. And, um, and, and thank you for that extraordinary poem and I, just listening to you um I, I was thinking actually how far we still have to go and how much hasn't changed um uh, I was it was International Women's Day as we all know yesterday and talking to to um some of my colleagues who um are, are female uh 
leaders who experience that kind of abuse and racism um, in on a, on a daily basis. Um, so we we still see that, um, and we've got so much so long to go in terms of representation, um, particularly black representation. And in May, Camden will have our first female black mayor, um, which uh, is brilliant. But but actually, <laughs> you know, the fact that it's taken this long um, and that we we still have um, just don't have enough black representation at the top of, of politics is is something that that calls on all of us to to act and and to to change it and i think as as your poem showed represent the how much representation does matter and we saw that during the pandemic um uh, in a, in a really deep way and olivia you were talking about the way that this pandemic has has had a disproportionate impact on our black and, and asian and other minority communities um but but the, the way that we saw health inequalities and other inequalities exasperated um, shone a light on deep and existing inequalities that we have been trying to work on and, and address in Camden and, and in other places. But those inequalities were not uh, a surprise in terms of employment, in terms of housing, uh, in terms of, of health inequalities. And they uh, are systemic and, and they've been there for, for a long time. And um, it, it requires representation and leadership to, to, to address them. And, and uh, I think if there's one positive that's come out of the pandemic is that there has been a bigger and more public conversation about race and equality. Um, and it, I think we can't, it, it has to be a moment for real change. And we, we, we have to ensure that, that, that it's not just a conversation, but, but, a, but a time for, for action and that it, it's recognized much more, more widely. Um, but also that it, it requires um, representation and leadership. And I, I know that at the start of the pandemic, it was only because uh, we had in, in the council and in, um, and in our political leadership leaders from Somali and Bangladeshi backgrounds who, who had strong links into communities that we started to hear about some of the disproportionate impact of the disease well before the data showed us. And we were able to, to take action um, quickly. Um, and do that in a way that that I hope um, made some difference. Um, but um, and and that demonstrates the the difference it does make. Um, and this this event um, I think is 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 part of a, a wider piece of work that we're doing around the renewal of Camden, which is which is a kind of promise to try and build back fairer to to not just recover from the pandemic, but to to recognise that before the pandemic, whether it's the climate crisis or racial injustice, there were there were deep uh, issues in in our society, um, uh, and if we if we are to recover, we need to do it in a way that transforms and, and changes things. And so we have four missions that are a kind of call to action to our community, and one uh, Dion started with, which is about uh, diversity and positions of power. Um, so so this event really uh, uh, on International Women's Day, we wanted to make sure that we weren't, we were talking about um, female leadership, which is which is deeply important, but but also that we're diverse female leadership and bringing different voices uh, to the front and, and hearing from, 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 from diverse voices. So on, on that note, I'm, I'm going to be quiet and really here, I'm here for the whole event, but really here to listen um, and, and to support. Um, and I just wanted to finish by by, by saying a huge thank you to everyone who made this happen. I'm, I'm so proud of the of the, the female leaders we, we have in Camden, particularly Janelle and Martha and Sandra, who I know have done so much behind the, the, the scenes to, to pull this event together. Um, so, so thank you for, 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 for all of, of, of your leadership. And, and I hope that this is the start of, of many events. As Olivia, you said, this is, it can't just be on International Women's Day. This has to be something that we live every day. So thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you so much. And um, I'd like to um, introduce um, uh, Tulip Sadiq, who's our MP in Hampstead and Kilburn, and um, and then afterwards, Councillor Nadia Shah. And they're going to be looking at you know, their, their own reflections on what leadership means to them and what they choose to challenge. Um, so um, as Georgia said, Canada is not short of leadership and of female leadership. Um, and that comes in all different shapes, sizes, and forms. 
Um, and we'll have a chance to hear from uh, two of our women leaders um, at the moment. So Tulip, are, are you there? I am. Hello. Oh, welcome Tulip. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak here today. And firstly, I just wanted to say that I'm very proud to represent an area with a borough like Camden, where Georgia is obviously our leader of the council. We have Jenny as our chief exec. We have people like Nadia Shah in, in our cabinet who make a huge difference. But just to say that without a strong network, you can't become an MP of an area like Hampstead and Kilburn. So I had Nadia, Georgia, lots of people supporting me. I had Abdul Hai supporting me as well. So it wasn't just women, it was also lots of men like Nash Ali who all supported me. And it's impossible as a woman to get to somewhere without having a strong network. And that's probably the first thing I would say. I wanted to speak a bit about politics and the journey that I've been on. So I've done every single job you can imagine in the Labour Party. So whether that's being a caseworker, a researcher, a policy advisor, a special advisor, a press officer, a councillor, a cabinet member, whatever you want to call it, I've done every job before I became an MP. And the reason I mention that is because one of the things I want to point out is that you can get representation at the top of a job. So in the upper echelons of any job, you can try and get lots of women, lots of women of color, but you also have to look at every layer of politics, I think, or every layer in a job. So for example, the Labour Party's worked really hard to get female MPs in Parliament. And I'm really proud that we have done a good job of that. And that is largely due to all women shortlist, which, by the way, I fully support. If you want to increase the number of women in politics, I think all women shortlist is a necessary evil. And I had a disagreement with this about with someone last night on the International Women's Day panel, but I stuck to my guns and I think it's a good thing. But if you look at every layer of politics and if you've done the jobs that I've done, then you know how important those jobs are. You know how important it is to be a policy advisor, to be in the leader's office, to be a press officer, uh, to be a chief whip, for example, or to be a chief of staff of a very important figure in politics. You know how important it is to be election coordinator or to be in the speaker's office. And sometimes I feel we miss that. I feel like we look at how do we get more women in, in the top positions of politics, but we don't look at the decision-making body. And that's one of the things I'd say to all the women in this call, that if you're in an organization or a company, Obviously, it's important to get women on board. It's important women to get in top positions. But look at the actual decision making and look at whether there are women there and if there are women of color there as well. And that brings me on to something that I'm sure will come up in this discussion is about intersectionality. There is obviously a job to be done in getting women into positions of power. There's also a job to be done for women who face double discrimination, whether that's women of color, women who have different sexual orientation, disabled women, women from working class backgrounds. I think there's a huge job to be done in not just looking at women in a homogenous group, that one silver bullet's going to solve everything, but looking at what makes life difficult for some women over others. And just to touch on coronavirus, because obviously we can't have any discussion now without looking at coronavirus. You've already heard from Olivia about health inequalities. A person from a Bangladeshi background is twice as more likely to die from coronavirus than someone who's white. There's someone, something wrong in the system if we haven't managed to overcome these health inequalities and it's something we need to look at. But what I wanted to touch on briefly more than that is the fact that my shadow portfolio is on children and early years. And I've seen the impact this coronavirus has had on women, especially mothers, the amount of childcare and homeschooling that has fallen disproportionately on mothers who've been working, how so many women have had to quit their jobs and go on furlough because they just cannot afford to do both. And that stems back to our gender pay gap, which still exists, which I'm embarrassed to say does very much exist. I've been a victim of it myself in a job as well, where I got paid 10,000 pounds less than the man sitting next to me and only found out because he got drunk one day and told me. And I was like, is that how much you get paid? because I get paid a lot less. And then don't worry, I negotiated hard after that. But it's just to remind you all that gender pay gap does very much exist. A lot of my friends um, who I became friends with at the same time I had children and they had children, so we're part of an NCT group. Out of eight women, three of them have faced maternity discrimination and coronavirus, just out of a small group of eight who got laid off from their jobs uh, because they had had children just before the pandemic and then it was basically used as an excuse to fire them. So let's keep an out, eye out on people and employers using 
coronavirus to then basically do gender discrimination when it comes to a lot of our women. And then I would say, finally, I don't want it to be all doom and gloom, but often I get asked about personal role models. Who are my role models? And I get that question asked a lot when I'm on a panel. And what I want to say to people is that you could pick out, I don't know, Oprah Winfrey talking about last night. You could pick out Barbara Castle. These are all role models. But for me, the real role models are the women that I meet every single day when I'm a constituency MP in the casework that I do. The young mother in Kilburn who told me that she's working three jobs because she wants to get her child into university, the chance that she never had. The woman who's fleeing from domestic violence, living in the council estate down my road, who's saying to me, I stayed on because of my children, but I can't take it anymore. The women who are disabled, but trying to make it on their own saying, well, I just want to make sure that I give my children what I never had. These are the role models I think we meet in everyday lives. And I noticed on the chat, we had people from West Houston Partnership, which I was a part of when I was a counselor, Little Village, where I know a lot of women do work to get basic necessities across to families who don't have it. These are the everyday role models. And I don't want to, um, I want to mention everyone, obviously, but I don't have time. But Sarah Calloway from my constituency is also on here, constantly fighting racism at all levels. And it's just to be aware that you may not realize it, but you're probably a role model for someone, a bit like what Dion talked about, that young Asian woman who came and inspired her. You may not realize after you've spoken to someone what an impact you have on their lives, but the women on this call and the women in my constituency constantly touch me. So just to say, don't underestimate yourself, these are my final words. Don't underestimate yourself. Negotiate hard when you're being underpaid. Go and do things, even if people tell you not to. So many people put obstacles in my way when I wanted to be the MP for Hampstead and Kilburn. One of the main excuses was, you're too short. <laughs> I'm four foot 11. And they kept saying that to me. When has that ever stopped anyone? It didn't stop me. The other excuse lots of people used against me was, you're getting married in the same week. Weirdly, I got married in the same week I got selected as a candidate. My husband didn't have a problem with it. Why did they? There were so many people. People will just say the most absurd things to you when you're running for positions of power. Please don't listen to them. Just do what you're going to do. And what I said at the beginning, build that strong network of women. Without the likes of Nadia and Georgia and Abdul, Hai and Nash Ali, I wouldn't have got to where I am. So make sure you build that strong network of men and women around you who will always encourage you and support you. Oh, Tulip. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you so much, Tulip. That's really inspiring and a good reminder that leadership can look different and that in just our daily, um, our daily lives, we can inspire and do inspire people, even if we don't know it. So um, straight over to Councillor Nadia Shah. Nadia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, welcome, Nadia. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hello, Hi. everybody. Um, I'm Nadia Shah, and um, I'm presently the um, cabinet member for Safer Communities in Camden. Um, I'm going to start with my pledge, actually. Um, my pledge is I choose to challenge gender inequalities and biases today and every single day. And that's what I will be doing and that's my pledge. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my background and some of the things that are faced. Um, so as I was growing up, I, I was, um, I had three, three other siblings who were all girls. Uh, so there's four of us and my par parents worked two jobs um, to give us the things that they couldn't have, you know, when they were, when they were growing up obviously economic migrants and um, my role model was my gran and I tell everyone this because my gran came over here um, just after the war because she she couldn't come over my granddad came earlier and uh, they're just faced with a war and then she had um, basically some really bad news that my granddad had been in a serious accident and um, broken all his limbs his ribs teeth everything she came here with three children. One of them was my mum, and my mum was about 10. Uh, she didn't have a good grasp of the language, although she kind of understood it. Uh, and then she just was landed in this situation where she's here, she's got to get her kids in school. Her kids don't know anything about the environment that they're living in. Everyone's a different colour. Um, you know, she 
took over a business. She started running my granddad's business. She had no idea how to communicate, but somehow she managed it. And this was all in her sari with a headscarf on. Um, and also, you know, nursing in terms of my granddad's health, him back to, you know, back to health so that he could help her. And then when I looked at, you know, those, the situation that she came here in and what she achieved, I always thought to myself, God, how, how did she do it? And I was, when I was born, I was literally, she was my best friend. I literally was stuck to her all the time. I wouldn't get off her lap. I wouldn't move away. I remember even there was this particular guy that worked in, in, in one of the restaurants and he used to scare the hell out of me. I don't know why. And I must've been about three or four because I've got really good long-term memory. He would scare me. I don't know, every time he came into the room, it scare me and my mom would feel a bit embarrassed and be like why is my daughter doing this you know and I remember trying to hide under my uh, nan's sari right the back of it <laughs> the bit that tapers off and then what she did was she'd bring me in front of her and hold me from behind so I'd feel secure and I remember those um, you know those those nurturing things about her as well as all the things that she achieved in her life um, and I also look back at, you know, when I first became a counsellor, it was like almost like a child starting school, you know, you're just looking around thinking, God, how does it all work? You know, how does it all work? Everyone seems to know what they're doing, but I seem a little bit lost. Like I'm not sure which committee I'm supposed to be on and where I'm supposed to be speaking and what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and everyone then said, you know, we all felt the same, but no one said it because I said it. I said, I feel a bit weird. And I've said, you know what, we all felt the same, but, um, but we didn't want to say it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I started off working in an investment bank and I did really well and I was quite young. And the discrimination I faced there being a young woman of colour on the floor. Um, you know, I, I remember I really enjoyed my job, but, you know, there was one point where, you know, people would be working there for hours and hours and I would come in, set, do my targets and then go home. People were thinking, what, what's going on here? Um, and, you know, people thought it was OK to, you know, come and, you know, touch me or pat me as they're walking past and things like that. And I didn't think it was OK. And I just didn't feel like I could cope. So I came back and I said, Dad, I don't want to work in, in the bank anymore. Um, I think I want to become a social worker. And he Nadia, me, said, Nadia, we've got just one more minute. Well, yeah, well, I'm getting, okay. I'm getting to the point. <laughs> so that doesn't earn you money. So he, he didn't agree with me. But let me get to the point. When I, when I became mayor um i i was obviously very pleased i had the support of all or everyone around me but i didn't under, realize that actually i was going to be the first female bangladeshi mayor when i went into the mayor's office um none of the robes fit me so that i had to get a brand new robe the gloves didn't fit me uh when i went to a, the first few mayoral um you know engagements that i had people were looking at the driver rather than at me because they're like oh look big white man he he's the mayor but actually it was me behind him that was wearing the chain <laughs> um, and one child said to me oh um is that father christmas so the child didn't understand that i was an asian woman all they saw was the red <laughs> the red um you know robes but i mean what what i would like to do is because i've only got short time i think i've rambled on slightly and i could go on and on and on and on so any of you can email me and contact me about some of the difficulties i've faced and the stereotypes but you know what i want to say is that we as women fight stereotypes every single day and I, and I dealt with it by going my way by showing leadership and by excelling with those who were supporting me and today you know the whole world can see that we're better off when women get the opportunities that they deserve as we're more than capable to, 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 and fit enough to lead. So I'll give you a quick recent example is that three women from Germany, the UK and the US led and developed the teams for the first three vaccines against the coronavirus. That's three women. Uh, and, you know, someone said to me, oh, you know, why do we have into, this was another comment a few years ago. And I think actually, we deserve the love and the support that the world gives us on International Women's Day as our contribution is massive in every sphere mm. in life. And we should never, ever forget that. This uh, Women's Day is for those on the front line, for those in the back office, it's for those health workers who are our guardian angels, it's for those sales assistants, it's for those mothers who took care of their children during lockdown whilst working from home. 
for those women who lost their jobs during the crisis, and those were mainly women of colour. But you know what? We, we, we make that table. We hold up society. You know, what, while we say we need a place at the table, we make that table, right? And we are the table. So let's not continue to settle for discrimination and, and insecurity and unfairness. We have to have a ro robust and fierce spirit. And that's why we will excel. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nadia, so much. Thank you. Hearing your story is inspiring and how you move through into, into your own leadership um, through your family and now is councillor in Camden. So, and mayor. So thank you so much. Um, we want to uh, kind of move on to a kind of breakout sessions so that you get a chance to kind of reflect on what you've heard, um, but also th thinking about what leadership means to you. And it's been really helpful hearing um, from Theofina and Georgia, Tulip and Nadia, th that, that leadership is broad, really broad. Um, so it's not just about your job. Um, so this is about reimagining what you want to see for, um, for yourself as any woman and for Black and Asian and other ethnic women. So we're going to be put into breakout rooms. Um, I, our team, uh, we've got a fantastic team kind of supporting um, this event and it's a big thank you to them. So I think you can see join right now. So sorry to anybody that might have been in the middle of talking, but we are going to have to move on because, as I said, we've got so much in this agenda today. So um, I hope you've had a chance that has given you the chance to really stimulate your thinking around what leadership might look like in the perfect world um, and where we're heading to. But now we're going to hear from some other leaders in our community. So we're going to talk leadership. It's speed talking. Um, the first person up is Rashida Graham from the Urban Community Projects. Oh my God, Dion, what do you want me to do? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Speedily. Um, I'm Rashida Graham. I'm the CEO at Urban Community Projects. And I was just saying in the breakout group, um, what does leadership mean to me? It's about being visible. It's actually about doing what it says on the tin, which is actually leading. Um, I think it's really important, especially for me being a black CEO, um, that I celebrate that, um, that I let people know that, that especially young black people that I come into contact with um, and that I'm proud of that role and that I do something with that role, that it means something. Um, not just to me, but it means something to the community that I work within. Um, so yeah, quickly, Leon, that's what leadership means to me. Thank you. And that's and that's so true, isn't it? It's about meaningful leadership. We, we have all seen leaders that are just there, taking up space. We don't need that. Okay, thank you. We're moving on to Fahana Yaz, um, Yamin, from the Commissioner from Camden Renewal Commission. Hey, thank you. So I, 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 um, I think we so often think of leadership in, in very individualistic, you know, the big hero, the dragon slayer terms, in very intellectual ways, you know, someone with a big idea sort of, you know, asking others to do it. And it's often very goal orientated, you know, a team has to come together and pursue the goal often of the great leader, you know, in some ways. And the kind of leadership that I love and want is much more collaborative it's much more based on lived experience not just a a big idea that came to you from somewhere else um, and it's really stressing the the process not just the journey of of how uh, we feel doing that uh, uh, the, the the task the collective task rather than just achieving the end goal i'm sure so many of us have felt you know sometimes frustrated by the end when the goal is achieved, we've had such a frazzled time and, you know, such an awful thing. We think we'll never, ever do that again. You know, a, a report that I've written, for example, recently, I'll never do that again. Great report, but, you know, uh, and I feel like that, that, that idea of leadership, uh, the more collaborative, creative, the more process orientated one is the one that will help us all to bring our whole selves to bring all the different qualities and talents that we have and not just privilege those who are 
more vocal, more intellectual, more goal orientated, but bring everyone uh, in, in, in a more balanced way together. So that's my, my sort of thoughts on, on the concept of leadership. But I don't know if you wanted me to say something about the commission's work. And I just had one, a couple of quick questions. Uh, you know, so the commission's, you know, this one idea of uh, people who hold positions of power will be as diverse as our community. You know, that is basically saying we will dismantle patriarchy and white supremacy in Camden. If we are able to do that, that's what it will mean. Uh, because, you know, we have got to try and do that ourselves. And I think bringing uh, and changing what we mean by positions of power. So each of us also recognizes we are holders of power. You know, whether we're in a, uh, you know, the CEO of a, an NGO, whether we're a council officer in a big department, we are all holding power. And so all of us have the opportunity to change our notion of leadership and to bring in constituencies and people who are younger, more diverse, who don't have formal degrees, for example, uh, and who are bringing lived experience and can contribute uh, to the, that shared goal. So that's what, kind of what I wanted to say. And it's a very exciting you know, mission to try and make happen. And we can maybe all start by getting rid of age requirements and really thinking about whether we need to add the word graduate, you know, degree required, because that takes away a huge number of people who can apply and who feel that they don't have the lived experience to do a job. Thank you. Thank you, Fahana. And, and yeah, what a challenge has been thrown down. But if you are thinking, if we are thinking of this as leadership, not being that lonely post somewhere saying this is how we do things, if we think of it as that collective challenge, then it does make it feel a bit more manageable, just a bit, but together we'll get there. Fabulous. We're going to try some technology now. So uh, bear with us. We're going to um, try a video um, from the Deputy Youth MP, Anya. Oh, there she is. My name is Anya Nedengadi and I am Camden's newly elected Deputy Youth MP. I also happen to be a British Indian woman. I fought for my platform as Deputy Youth MP because I am very passionate about tackling the divide between the public school education and the private school education in Camden. The inequality in the quality of education has increased significantly due to COVID and I want to lessen this divide. However, I believe that inequality reaches far beyond the issues that youth face in our borough. Women in the workplace, for example, face challenges every single day, not just in terms of a pay gap or economic inequalities, but also in terms of navigating the tough social scene of male dominated offices. It is more important than ever that we, ethnic women, take positions of strength and leadership so that we can be role models for future generations. What does leadership mean to you? To me, leadership is not about power. It is about allowing everybody's voice to be heard. It is about mentoring people who don't have opportunities that you have. And it's about showing individual determination, resilience and focus, while also knowing how to delegate and listen to your team. Above all, it is about balancing compassion and ambition. What do I mean by this? It is about knowing when to prioritize the interests of your team above your own. How would you like to champion gender equality? If I could champion gender inequality, sorry, gender equality in one way, I would fight for women to gain the same amount of respect that men automatically have. We women have to work 10 times harder to get a job to a certain idea or to receive a promotion. This is the foundation of gender inequality because it stops us from collaborating or leading efficiently. What does an ideal world where all women have equal opportunities look or feel like to you? A gender equal world to me is a world where women are accepted to jobs, not just because their male bosses have to fill some quota. A gender equal world to me is a world where the number of male and female CEOs are equal. And above all, a gender equal world is a world where women have the same amount of respect that men receive. 
Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. What a fabulous job she did. I'm so glad that that, um, that video played for us. Um, so, yeah, that's our Deputy Youth MP for Camden there. Um, we're going to move on. So we've got Uju Asika. Sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. Please do correct me. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I am Uju. I am a blogger, screenwriter, former journalist, and I'm the author of Bringing Up Race, How to Raise a Kind Child in a Prejudiced World. Now, for me, leadership begins in the home. Um, I feel like mothers are the most undervalued, underserved, but important leaders in our communities because realistically, we're the ones who are building the future. We're the ones who are raising the next generation. So part of my motivation for writing the book was getting children and their mothers and their, well, their fathers as well, but specifically their mothers to talk about issues such as race and identity and how you can progress and become more empathetic and open to other cultures and embrace different cultures. Um, for me, leadership is really about as other people have said, it's not about putting yourself first. It's really about putting other people first, seeing something, having a vision for a way the world could look or imagining the way your community could look and deciding, okay, I'm gonna do something, even if it's outside my comfort zone. A lot of women tend to um, experience imposter syndrome. Something Anya said just reminded me of this. this a saying about how you should learn to carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man. I don't know if you've ever heard this saying, but it's something that I think about a lot practically every day because a lot of women, a lot of brilliant, brilliant women are still sitting with and living with imposter syndrome, feeling like, oh, I can't put myself out there for you know a number of reasons, a number of barriers and actually, if you can just sort of step beyond your comfort zone and decide that what you what you plan to do, what you envision is more important than your sense of inexperience or lack of expertise, then you know you can really do a lot and, and create a lot of change. So that's kind of my um, yeah, my my message to everyone is to remember to carry yourself with the confidence of that mediocre white man. Um, and I'm also really just pleased to see, like I said in the breakout room, to see quite a few men in this group because there's no real female leadership without men being part of that, being part of that solution, being part of that collaboration and you know, deciding that yes, women also don't just deserve a seat at the table. You know, We are the table together, all of us, men and women. Fabulous. And I think we'll all be taking that, that quote back away with us. So thank you for that. And talking about mothers, because this is International Women's Day, I'm just going to throw this in. Uh, my five-year-old, a few days ago, I was saying to her, Ella, why do you not listen to what I'm saying? Why is it I'm telling you to do something and you are just not doing what I'm asking you? And she said really calmly, mummy, it's because I'm being true to myself. And when you're true to yourself, you don't listen to other people. Well, that shut me up. Anyway, um, we will move from that empowered five-year-old uh, to Dr. Arch Archna Tina Agrawal. I'm sorry again if I pronounced your name wrong, please do correct me, um, from the museum practice. So hi, it's, it's, it's fine, it's Tina Agrawal, I use my middle name, but um, thank you for having me. Um, just because I don't know many people in, in the room, um, just to give you a bit of background, um, I'm a GP in South Camden, um, I'm one of few, uh, very few um, female Asian partners in, in general practice uh, in Camden. Camden is actually probably ahead of itself in terms of the medical profession and representation across the council and the board, but still I think there's a long way to go. Um, I think I wanted to share a bit of my background with you. Um, um, I'm in, uh, I was born in India and I came here when I was very little. Um, my parents were both economic and educational migrants. They came in the 70s to do a bit of a degree and, 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 and earn a bit of money and take it back like most migrants did. 
um, but they found themselves here. Um, they had a very strong uh, work ethic, which I think comes um, across in, uh, with a lot of women as well and, and, and men, um, but especially from where you have to, uh, positions where you have to prove yourself. Um, they worked a day job, a, an evening job, a weekend job. Um, there wasn't any formal childcare in those days. So we were dragged to lots of different places. We would sit in the car quietly for hours on end while they did their work or um, in a room somewhere pretending we weren't, we weren't there and we and, um, would read a book so we didn't get noticed. Um, sort of key, uh, kids that are left to their own devices a lot of the time. But my parents were actually both doctors and they struggled with childcare. And I think it's a really important message for women who are often um, juggling more than one job, um, both economically, physically and mentally, that they really need support with. Um, and it's weird that in the 21st century, we're still talking about childcare as a separate issue. You get a company car, you get a loan to have a bike, but you don't really get the support that you need um, to do that. And often we're, um, you know, if you work part time, you're seen as half a person or half a leader, rather than actually that actually you're juggling lots of different roles. You're a carer, you're a mother, you're a professional, um, you're a breadwinner. And I think that needs to be recognized. Um, and one of my most inspiring leaders, obviously, I think for all of us is our, our parents, um, especially our mothers, because they show us the way, they, 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 they work very hard to provide for us. But another one was the, the GP that I worked with, who where I started off at my training practice at the museum practice, um, Dr. De Denise Baven, who's now retired. But she would um, to present me in lots of awkward situations. Said, oh, Tina, I can't go to that meeting. Can you go to it? And naively, I would just turn up to the meeting with a, a room full of people, not knowing what to do, what to ex expect. But I was, was not scared to speak. Um, and I would say, well, this doesn't sound right. And, and that way I got pushed forward and I am where I am. Um, and I wear lots of different hats. So I'm a, a senior partner in my practice. Um, I'm a GP trainer. I'm a co-chair of the London, local London Camden LMC. I'm a quality improvement lead. And, and through Sandra, I've been given another seat at the table, which is, it's, it's nice for people to be pushing other people forward into hearing different voices and different stories. So I just wanted to say thank you. But I think we really need to push that agenda for everybody, whether it's a man or woman, childcare is equally important for both sets. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's diminished uh, and not supported as, as I think it should be. So opportunity and support is, is my key message. Thank you so much, Tina. And, and yes, isn't it a huge juggling act? But and we keep on, that's the thing, we keep on adding more things, more balls to this, this endless juggle. So it's, it's amazing what so many people achieve. And sometimes only when you're listing it, you think, wow, I'm doing all of those things. Right, we have been listening a lot and I know it's a lot to take in and people wouldn't have even had a chance to, to go to the loo. So we are gonna have a quick break. Before we go to that break, Rashida, who did such a fabulous job of being speedy, would you like to um, leave us with a couple of inspirational words? Um, just, to th I would say something that my mum always taught me. Um, you can be and do anything you wanna be. And I think that's a really important message for, I would say, Black and Asian and ethnic minorities that we can be and do anything we want to be. Um, and as I've got older, I think it's such a shame that my mum even had to tell me that because that was her subtle way of probably saying to me all the, all the obstacles that would be put in my way because I was Black. But she just couldn't, she didn't tell me that. I was probably too young to tell me that. But I, that's always stuck with me and it's something that I always tell the young people that I work with as well. You can be and you can do anything you want. So that's my inspirational message I'm going to leave all you wonderful women and all you wonderful leaders with. We are going to start back. <laughs> Even though everybody was enjoying that, we'll have to have that at the end or something. Um, so welcome back. I'm sorry that that was such a short break, but it is important to factor at least some tiny break in. Um, but now we're going to move into our second part, the breakout sessions. Um, we're going to think now, we've talked about what we want things to look like, but how do we get there? Um, what can we do? What part can each individual one of us and collectively can we play in making this not just about the talk but about making it happen so you will be called into breakout rooms and we will see you on the other side thanks
do we need more than one day to do this? I think so. I think so. Um, this has been so important. Um, and I know in the group I was in, um, there was there were really good suggestions around um, how to how we might look at taking things forward. Um, and so, for example, childcare is quite a key issue. Um, the pandemic has thrown up um, issues of flexible working for both men and women um, and for young people. So there, there there's so many lessons to be learned. But given the time we have available, it really looks as if we're not going to be able to um, hear all of the feedback from the different groups. So I'm hoping that um, the feedback will get posted on a notice board for participants and perhaps the wider council to um, see the suggestions that were, were made. Um, so for this last part of, of the, the program, we have um, Councillor Hai, who um, is our cabinet member for Young People and Equalities and Cohesion, um, just to reflect on the importance of allyship and um, what pledges and actions they're going to take away as a result. And um, also um, Shan Berry from the Green Party and Maria Higson. So it's a very tight, we've got a very kind of tight uh, period of time to kind of fit that in. So um, uh, Councillor High, would you like to start us off and just briefly say thank you. Thank you so much. So my name is Councillor Abdul. Hi, I'm the Cabinet Member for Young People, Qualities and Cohesion. I'd like to thank everyone for the attendance and particularly the speakers, what they've said. And I think you've given us so much to think and so much to take back in terms of with, with leadership and what, what it looks like in an ideal world, it's particularly for Councillor Shah, uh, our MP and a few others, um, and, and the leader about sharing their own experiences. And that really amplifies um, what it takes uh, to lead and, and, and collaboration working in partnership and making sure that we're able to confront those ch challenges to, to, together. But also hearing from our deputy youth MP, and it's really important that we hear young people's voices because they're going to be our tomorrow's uh, future. In terms of my pledge, uh, I'll act as an ally for gender equality and hold myself to account as a cabinet member to ensure that we deliver on our commitments on gender equality, and especially given the challenge uh, uh, chosen to challenge uh, as part of the International Women's Day, um, I'll make sure that within my capacity, I'll work with everyone. Wherever I see gender inequality, I'll, I'll confront it. And just to sort of finish uh, with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, and he said, you must be the change you want to see in the world. And I think sometimes we've got to work towards, uh, if we see an equal society, then we've got to confront it and work together, never to give up. Thank you, Councillor High. Thank you so much, um, you know, for your comments and your pledge. Um, having um, a key leader in the council, such as yourself, um, pledge for gender equality is important to us all. Um, Sean Barry, would you just like to say a few words? Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, I wasn't here for all of it. I had a committee meeting in the assembly, so I've heard quite a lot of people's contributions. Um, it's so important that we do diversify leadership. To quote um, a campaign, an environmental campaign, um, to change everything, we need everyone. And it does mean that we need everyone feeling empowered to make changes in society. And that's really important. So the, the point I take away from this is that we need to not just simply bring people who are more diverse into existing power structures. We need to create new power structures, more devolved power, more devolved decision making so that people at all levels, um, across all communities of all genders, feel more comfortable in taking leadership roles in, in places where they're already comfortable. I certainly as a woman have, have you know, had to adapt to operating in a very male dominated profession. And I think we shouldn't expect everyone to adapt. We should adapt our structures instead. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, is Councillor Maria Higgs in there? No. Okay. Then um, we've got 
the kind of closing reflections um, from Helen Reardon Bond, who's the co-chair of the Women's Forum. Helene, are you there? Hi. Helene. Uh, oh, hi, Helene. Hi. Um, just to say thank you so much for such an inspirational event. Um, it's a real privilege um, to, to be invited and to speak. And I know you're really short of time, but um, I've been asked to speak about how the work today connects with the Camden Women's Forum. So just quickly for people that don't know about this forum, and please, once you hear it, I hope that you'll go out and be advocates for us. Um, it was established by the leader, Georgia Gould, in 2019. I was really kindly appointed to be the co-chair with Angela Mason. For those that don't know me, and um, forgive me if you've heard this before, but I was born in Camden. I was brought up on a council estate. I've never lived anywhere else. And against all the odds, I ended up following in Angela Mason's footsteps and being the head of the Government Equalities Office. So hence, I got the appointment, which is a real honour. The forum is championed at a really senior level in Camden by Georgia, Angela, Jenny, um, Samata and um, Joe Brown. As, as, as has been said throughout today, um, and much more eloquently than me, Camden is a really di diverse borough. In the forum, we really believe strongly that, this, that, that we need the strong voice of ethnic minority, black women, <clears throat> women from all different backgrounds and walks of life to have a strong voice. <clears throat> Excuse me. The ideal of equality of opportunity will just remain an ideal if we don't have diversity of views and opinions shaping the big decisions of, the, uh, of Camden. And as we all know, it's actions that speak much louder than words. Therefore, the forum, um, we think and we hope is representative. Um, we're really lucky to have um, excellent members from our black and ethnic communities as um, members. We've got Benifa, who was on earlier, the CEO of Hopscotch. We've got Khadija from the British Somali organization. Um, we have Councillor, um, cartoon and we've been supported also by Abdul Hai previously and we have Maria um, it's cross party and we have Maria um, Higson for the conservative a conservative councillor so our first inquiry was into women's employment in Camden and our current one is into domestic abuse as we know rates of domestic abuse have rocketed um during covid and women's experiences of that and also coming out of covid what's going to happen to them, them in the labor market is going to be really important because that both of those things will hold back women and girls and affect their life chances and um, we recognize that building a future camden for girls and women to have real influence is a long-term project um, there is an entrenched cynicism around politics and participation, which cannot easily be addressed, and it certainly won't be done overnight. And it's great that last year, something really positive came out of um, George Floyd's murder, and we had the Black Lives Matter um, camp, global campaign. Um, however, the forum has the wholehearted support of Camden. Um, but as I said earlier, it's really the practical actions that make things change. But just a small tangible um, example is that during our first inquiry, we met the most amazing women who had fantastic qualifications from overseas. And Jenny approved a fund to help those women um, convert their qualifications um, so that they could get into and more importantly, progress in the workplace. I think that we can all see from today that overcoming stereotypical attitudes and institutional racism, which is the dominant culture and the, and the political establishment requires a willingness from all of us to communicate and cooperate, to find and reach solutions. So I really think today's event um, that we can all pull together and work behind has been really inspirational for me. I've learned a lot and I'm really glad that I was invited 
um, please do promote the work of the um, or of the forum if you can. Thank you. Thank you, Helene. Thank you so much um, for talking about the Women's Forum. Um, uh, Jenny, um, who Jenny Rowland, who is the chief exec of Camden Council, um, would you like to speak now, Jenny? Hi. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I am so thankful that you've given us a few minutes at the end of the meeting. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, taking the time, as we said at the beginning to be part of this morning. It's given me huge energy and uh, I felt so privileged to hear all of the conversations. But um, I guess we wanted, uh, uh, you know, particularly following on, um, we'd talked in our sessions about where are those places that women can come together and talk about leadership um, and talk about uh, barriers to equality and talk about diversity and actually I just want to say I think the women's forum is one of the perfect spaces that we can use even more over the next year um, we've had lots of discussion in the groups I've been in about how do we come together across the big organizations like health and the local authority but also across all of our partnership organizations to use our voice together to challenge existing systems and to look at how um, we talked a lot about new power and old power. And I thought Fahana talked about collaboration. And what we've seen during the pandemic is that we can move faster together with high trust and belief in devolving our decision-making out into communities. And honestly, we've worked brilliantly and it's the way we want to work as women leaders. So that kind of collaborative way of bringing people together rather than a bureaucratic uh, hierarchical um, offer. And um, I think we've had some really good challenges today about how do you reimagine new structures that have room for everyone. And I don't, I think we need more time and I think we've had a good challenge back to us to say a day isn't enough. You know, we need this to be, I, I was saying, I came into local authority in the 80s. Um, at that time, you had proper childcare, you had proper systems to allow people to take part more equally in the workplace. I think we lost something along the way. And I think, you know, we need to spend time to look at what's our reimagined future so that women leaders can flourish. And the other challenge we had today was don't, you know, obviously we're not just talking about women le as leaders, we're talking about women at every part of our society. And we had a very passionate discussion about how we, when women want to come into the workforce, we still haven't cracked the ability to um, properly uh, value unpaid work of women as carers it just doesn't happen and so you could have had the most brilliant leadership skills in your own home but that does not translate into paid work still so there's a lot to do um, we talked about compassion and trust and, and helping each other to have a go at something and the fact that things don't need to be perfect and I think we had a lot of hope in our group about how we can come together. Um, my formal bit of this is obviously, I think it's in, it's proper Georgia started and I'm here to say, um, Abdul's just spoken as well as Camden Council, you know, we will hold ourselves to account. We want to be transparent. Um, we've had very strong discussions over the summer, particularly um, around Black Lives Matter. We've got action plans with targets and I want to take you back to the renewal commission action plan around having a representative workforce of all of our diversity by 2030. So we will write up all the points today. We'll come back and talk about where and how we can have those conversations, but it is a commitment from today. And I think it, it's been said several times, you know, we don't just want to meet on International Women's Day. However, it was fantastic. And thank you to everyone for organizing it. Thank you, Jenny, so much. And thank you to all of our speakers um, today. Um, I, I don't think Camden is short on role models um, and leadership, whether that's in the council or in the community, as we said. So um, Dion is actually going to wrap up and I'll, I'll just say that there are 
many people to thank um, for bringing this workshop. And Sandra Satirio is the key person who actually made, um, who spearheaded uh, International Women's Day. So there's a big thank you to Sandra and the team, uh, Kieran Ferdinand and Janelle Hutton Parr and Martha Daniels and the facilitators um, who you know, did the tech and everything. So there's a lot of uh, to, um, unseen work that's gone on. Um, and so really just wanted to appreciate them. And it's really thank you for me um, to for inviting me uh, to be part of this event. Dion. Thank you, Olivia. We really appreciate having you. Um, and thank you, everybody. So we will, as um, as you've heard from Jenny and others, we will be continuing this work as part of the commission. Um, and you have been talking about your pledges and your actions. We've got those. We know who you are. We will be coming back to make sure you are part of that solution being built for the future. So it's exciting to know that we have many more um, op opportunities to get together on this journey and we'll be able to look back at one day and say, well, look at what we've achieved collectively together. Um, we will be getting in touch uh, to ask people if they are happy for their contact details to be shared. I've had lots of people mention that they would love those networking opportunities. Um, we need to make sure information about existing networks are out there, that people understand how they can link into the Women's Forum. So we will do all of those things. But if you are happy to be contacted, you don't know who you might have touched in these conversations, it would be great if you could put your contact details out there. Um, and my one your old has come home now so it's probably a bit busy but just thank you continue this work and um we will see you not next international women's day but much sooner before then <laughs>